I love dearly. Uh, and he's got an anniversary today. And for the past couple of years, we've acknowledged it. And I think it's important we do again. Uh, go ahead and stand up, Brother Sneed. Today's three. Three years clean and sober. I praise the Lord for that. That's huge. That's huge. Everybody say, God works. God works. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have truly healed my brother. And today, this weekend, he is celebrating three years, no drugs. Lord, I'm grateful for that. And I'm thankful, Father, that you're not done with him. I'm thankful that you're not done with us either. Lord, I pray in the name and in the blood of Jesus Christ that I myself would not be seen nor heard at all. I'm not interested in that. My heart's desire is that you and you alone would be seen and heard, living and speaking and breathing throughout my life. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart and a mind that's ready to accept what you have for us through your word. As your Bible teaches us, Father, that your Holy Spirit will teach us all things. May we be willing, may we be willing to receive the lessons that you have for us today. Teach us how we can apply your word to our lives right now. May we leave this house recharged, refreshed, encouraged, and strengthened. In the mighty name and the precious, cleansing, powerful blood of Jesus Christ, who is alive and well, all God's people said together, amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy of it all. Look at your neighbor say, I'm glad you showed up. <clears throat> Jesus is alive and well, and I'm looking forward to seeing him one day. Anybody else? Amen. Over the course of the past month, I've been talking to you about creating New Year's resolutions, having dreams, visions, and goals, and then making sure that we follow through on them. We've seen in Scripture how the enemy attacks, how the enemy distracts, and how the enemy tries to spoil what you've set out to do for the kingdom of God in your life. And let me just say this, the enemy does not want you honoring God with your life. The enemy does not want you honoring God with your heart, with your mind, with your speech, with your actions. The enemy does not want you honoring God at your home, at your workplace, in and around your communities, with your buddies in the garage. The enemy does not want that at all. One thing we learned from the life of Nehemiah, which is what we've been studying over the past few weeks, is not to give up when the enemy attacks. And you can rest assured that the attacks are coming. We studied that pretty heavily this past week. But today, church, today we're getting out of the book of Nehemiah. We're getting into the New Testament today. And today we are going to see in Scripture how the plan of God, listen closely, the plan of God is unstoppable. It's unstoppable. Which means when you are a part of that plan and you are walking in the will of God, when you are walking in the strength of the Holy Spirit of God in and for your life, keeping in step with the Spirit of God, listen closely, you too are unstoppable. The enemy will not win. You know my favorite, my most favorite days of the week, uh, if, I, if, I, if I was forced to choose, would be Thursdays and Sundays because in those moments, I get to preach the Word of God to more than just one person. Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the other days, you look for opportunities to, to minister and share. Don't get me wrong. But I love coming into a corporate setting where I know the devil is not happy that I get to preach to you the Word of God. I know without a doubt the devil is already lost. How many people agree with that? The Bible says that he's already been disarmed, which means he has no power other than that which we volunteer unto him to have in our own lives. 
But I love the fact that I know without a doubt that today the devil loses again. Because the word of God is going to encourage you today. And so the plan of God is unstoppable. Therefore, when we line up in the plan of God, we too are unstoppable. Let's get into it. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Go there with me, if you will, please, church, in your Bibles. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. If you're here today and you do not have a Bible, see me before you leave. We want to be a blessing and give you one free of charge. You don't have to fill anything out. We just want to give you the Word of God. If you do not have the Bible with you right now, the Scripture will be on the screen in just a moment. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 is where we're going to begin, church. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And the word of God, praise unto the Lord, teaches and says this. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Amen. Multitudes of both men and women. Amen. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were, say it with me, and they were all healed. Verse 17, but the high priest, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. But during the night, everybody say during the night. Man, this just makes all the difference in the world. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and bought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to preach. The same group of people, and I want to make this clear to you today, the same group of people that crucified Jesus Christ we now see in the text they are trying to stop the apostles from teaching and preaching the truth. The same ones that were yelling crucify him. The same ones that sent him to the cross are now the same ones trying to completely shut down the ministry of the Lord. With that in mind, I want you to turn to the Gospel book of John. Go to John's Gospel, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we're going to begin together in the 18th verse. John chapter 15, verse 18. We're going to get through a lot of Scripture today in a lot of time. Amen? Amen. Notice I didn't say a lot of Scripture in a little bit of time. John 15, 18, look at what it says. Check this out. Jesus speaking in the text here. Jesus says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, anybody ever felt that before? If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not of the world. If you're in Christ, you're not. If you're in Christ, you're no longer of the world. He says, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world, what? The world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. There's the problem. Jesus says they're going to do all this to you because they don't know God. 
And if they did know God, then they'd know me as his son. If, if they knew God, they'd understand the plan of God. So the problem is, Jesus from his own mouth says, the problem is they don't know God. The problem the government is in the situation we're in now is because too many of them within government don't know God. The problem, the, the problem with the world today, they don't know God. The problem with nations today, they don't know God. It's been happening from the very beginning of time. Jesus, he lets his followers know that the world, the world is going to hate us. He said if they, if they persecuted him, that they're also going to persecute us. He, he reminds us that the world shows its hatred towards us. And then he says, remember this, remember this. Yeah, they hate you, but remember this, they hated me first. There are going to be people in your life, and before we go any further, you need to understand this. There are going to be people in your life who genuinely want the best for you. They really do mean well, but they just don't want to see you live a life that honors God, a life that places God first. They're, they're going to try to convince you that it's okay to be a Christian and still let a little bit of the world back into your heart. Look at your neighbor and say, don't go there. I'm going to show you this in scripture. See, the enemy, the enemy will try to stop you. The enemy will try to stop you from walking in the plan of God. After all, remember what we started out with this morning. The plan of God is unstoppable. And when you line up with the plan of God, because the plan is unstoppable, you're unstoppable. So what the enemy wants to do is pull you away from the plan of God that God has for your life and for your, for your marriage and, and for your family and for your church and at your workplace and your school and your college and your community. The enemy wants to get you away from walking in the plan of God. Let me tell you how he does it. Little fox type ways. The little foxes. If you're taking notes, write that down. Watch out for the little foxes. Watch out for the little foxes. See, I don't have a problem walking through my house not running into the couch. It's rather large. My problem is stepping on the Lego that I did not see. The little fox. It's, it's the little fox. This is how he does it. The enemy's real slick. He, he'll try to bring in old habits. Anybody been there before? Tempted with old habits that you used to do before you got saved? Here's another way he does it. He'll bring old relationships back into your life. Anybody been tempted with that? Before you were saved, hadn't heard from these people for over 10 years. All of a sudden, get saved. A month later, the phone rings. A blast from the past. Hmm. Here's another way he does it. Old passions and lust. Old passions and lust. Write this, write this down, Matthew 9, 17. Jot that down if you're taking notes. Matthew chapter 9 in the 17th verse. Jesus is speaking in this text, and I want you to pay close attention to what Jesus is teaching. This is what he says, Matthew 9, 17. Jesus Christ says this, Neither is new wine, neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine, watch this, but new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. Listen to what Jesus is teaching in the text. New wine requires new skin. Write that down if you're taking notes. New wine requires new skin. My new way of living as a Christian my new way of living, your new way of living, cannot coexist with our old way of living before we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. New wine needs new skin. I cannot think for one second that I'm going to live a life of righteousness and allow old filth to come in. They do not belong together. Write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We see the apostle Paul writing. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul writes this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, 
What happens? The new has come. Keep that verse up there for a moment. We're going to read this out loud together as a church. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, stop right there. Notice. Notice the benefit are for those who are in Christ. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, it can be for everybody, but everybody don't have it. That's the problem. It's available to everybody, but not everybody has it. Jesus was speaking to that when he says, not everybody knows God. That's why they hate you, and that's why they hate me. Because they just don't know God. They don't understand love, for God is love. Get it back up there, that verse from Paul. Ready from the beginning. One, two, three, go. Therefore, if... Stop right there. New creation. Look at the person you came to church with. If they came with an attitude this morning, they weren't living in the new creation. If they, if they woke up with a bad mood, they're not living in the new creation. We've got to be constant, constant in the new creation that God has made us and transformed us into. Constant. Get that verse. Here we go. From the beginning. Ready? One, two, three, go. Therefore, if... Let me give you some encouragement here. If someone calls you that blast from the past type of person, this is what you must do. When you answer the phone and they want to hang out, say, hey, look, that guy died. Wait, wait a minute. It sounds like you. It's still your number. No, no, no. That man died. That woman died. But let me tell you who has this number now. See, I still got the same name, but I got a new family. I still got the same name, but I got a new circle of people. And you're welcome to come check it out anytime you want. You're welcome to walk in the same life I'm walking in. You're welcome to aspire to the same goals that I got. But I'm going to tell you, there's this, there this man named Jesus Christ, and I've been buried with him. I've died to the flesh, and now I'm alive in Jesus Christ. But the guy that you used to know, the girl that you used to know, they're dead. And I'd like to introduce you to the new so-and-so. That is an opportunity for ministry. You cannot take old skin and put new life into it. A new life requires a new body. Write that down if you're taking notes. A new life requires a new body. The old me has passed away. Listen and thank God he has. Now there are times when I'm not perfect. I confess that to you guys almost weekly. There are times when I'm not perfect and the old me tries to creep up into be part of the new me, but they cannot coexist. They cannot coexist. So if you didn't write what Paul said down, again, it's in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let me just say this for, before we press on. If you want a new way of living, and we all should, amen? If we want a new, a new way of living, we must, first, we must first fully accept the new life in Jesus Christ. We must first fully accept. Notice the key word is fully. I cannot partially accept it. And that's the problem with a lot of Christians. They, they partially accept. And so they let a little bit of light in and they still got a little bit of darkness in there. And you cannot partially accept it. You've got to fully accept the new life that Jesus has for you. Go back to Acts chapter 5, 17. And let's, let's pick up where, kind of about where we left off. Just go to Acts 5, 17. I want to give you something to consider here in Scripture. We're going to talk about angels for a moment. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy. See their problem? They're jealous. 
This is something dangerous about jealousy. It'll cause you to do things you really don't want to do. So these Sadducees, the scripture says they're, they're filled with jealousy. Verse 18, they arrested the apostles and they put them in public prison. This is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, but this is one of my go-to reasons when someone asks, hey, how, how do you know what you believe is real? At that point, Jesus has been crucified and he's gone on to glory to receive his glorified body from the Father. At that point, Jesus is he's no longer walking to a ministry on earth. If it was a sham, and I'm one, of the, I'm one of the apostles that they come to take to prison, public prison, if it was all a sham at that moment, I'd say, okay, you got me, man. It's all made up. I'm going back home. I'm not going to jail for this stuff. The leader's gone. The teacher is gone. My master is gone. The one that we called Messiah is gone. Why in the world would they still be willing to go to public prison for a man that was gone if it were not real? They live with them. They commune with them. They fellowship with them. Went down to bed, woke up with them. They were constantly with them. They knew what they saw was legit. They knew what they saw was legit. So much so to the point that not only were they willing to go to prison more than once, but the majority of them were murdered for what they believed in. Murdered for what they believed in in Jesus. Murdered because they would not shut up about their faith. Murdered because they would not hide the gospel message behind closed doors. Murdered because they continued to advance the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within them. That tells me it's real. Because if someone were coming to kill me for what I believe in and it was all a sham, then at that moment of driving the sword through me or, or, or being crucified upside down or one of them dipped in a vat of boiling oil, at that point, I say, yeah, that oil looks hot. I don't want that. Because everything we've been doing is fake and I'm not going to die for something that ain't real. They died for it. They died for it. Now, look at this point in Scripture. Here they are. They're put in public prison. Verse 19, but during the night, Acts 5, 19, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and bought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life capital L in life. Verse 21, and when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak, and they did what, church? And began to preach. Listen closely, church. Listen closely to what I'm about to say. Everyone must hear this. Angels are not at all to be worshipped. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> Angels are not at all to be worshipped. And I want to make that very clear before we begin to talk a little bit about angels. In Revelation 22, verse 9, write that down. Revelation 22, verse 9. In Revelation 22, 9, John falls down to worship an angel. Okay? John falls down in Revelation 22, 9 to worship an angel. And this is what the angel says when John falls down to worship him. The angel says this. You must not do that! With an exclamation mark. You must not do that! He go, the angel goes on to say, he says, I am a, watch this, this is so important. He says, I am a fellow servant with you. Do you see that? Angels are created to worship God, yes, but part of their mission, part of their ministry is to serve every one of you in this room. They do it in ways that we don't even see them doing it. And one of the bigger ways is through spiritual warfare. Oftentimes protecting us and keeping us from things that we'll never be made known of, aware, aware of on this earth. Now look at, what it, look at what the angel goes on to say. He says, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, period. And then the angel says this, two words, what's it say? Worship God. So from the get-go, the angel tells John, 
don't worship me. And in the close of the statement, the angel tells John, worship God instead. So we've got to understand that angels cannot and should not be worshipped. Angels, write this down if you're taking notes, angels are servants who minister to us as we serve the Lord. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Angels are servants who minister to us as we serve the Lord. Now, you should not go looking to listen and hear from voices of angels. We should be looking to hear from the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? But we must understand the team that we've been equipped with, and I'll show you that in Scripture in just a moment. Write this down. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 speaks of angels, and it speaks of the church. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, it says this concerning the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Again, I'm going to read it to you. Hebrews 1.14 are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You may remember when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 12, 7 through 8. Jot that down. You could look at it later. Acts chapter 12, 7 through 8. We find Peter in prison, and there's an angel who comes up, and the angel touches Peter. New Testament now, New Testament. The angel touches Peter on his side and tells him to get up. And then when the angel touches Peter and tells him to get up, he then gives him some directions. The angel says, get up, dress yourself, put your sandals on your feet, get your cloak on yourself. And then the angel told him to follow him out of jail. Write this down, 2 Kings chapter 6, 15 through 17. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. In 2 Kings 6, 15 through 17, we see Elisha. We see the servant of Elisha. He wakes up in the morning, leaves his tent. He goes out, and in the distance, he sees that they have been surrounded by an army with horses and chariots, completely surrounded, completely surrounded. And Elisha prays that God would open the eyes of his servant, and God did. God does open the eyes of the servant of Elisha. And the servant was able to see in that moment what had been there the entire time. It had been there the entire time that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. An army from God. And Elijah said this. I love this. Elijah says this in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elijah says to the servant, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. There are more angels in heaven than there are angels that fell to the earth when Satan was thrust down. Do you understand that? Everybody say, God's got more. God's got more. God's got more, hallelujah, praise God, glory to the Father. God has got more than the enemy does. God always has more than the enemy does. And so Elisha tells the servant, hey, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Could you imagine what the servant, when he first gets up and he walks out to tent in the morning, and he just <sighs> gets out there Gives a little stretch and opens up his eyes. Whoa! It, all around the city. It says that all around the city they were surrounded by horsemen, horses, and chariots. Oh my goodness, I can understand what he's going through at that moment. He comes in, he tells Elisha, Man of God, man of God, there's a problem. We've got a problem, man. What's the problem? We're surrounded. We are surrounded by the enemy. And I love, I love Elisha's go-to. He just starts talking to the Lord. Oh, God, just show him. Matter of fact, the prayer that he prays to the Father is, Lord, just open his eyes. 
See, I think there would be times in our life where we would be much better off as followers of Christ if rather than get stressed out, we would just simply pray, Lord, open my eyes. Write that down if you're taking notes. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes to see this person how you see him because right now they're getting on my nerves. Open my eyes to see how you love this person because I got to love them the way you love them because right now I don't love them a whole lot of nothing. Lord, open my eyes to understand what you're walking me through right now because I'm not getting it right now. God, I'm not getting it. And so Elisha prays, Father, open his eyes. And he does. And when he looks, he sees that they are surrounded not just by an enemy, but they are surrounded by the army of God that far outweighs, outlast, and outnumbers the army of the enemy. And at that moment, peace can settle in. See, oftentimes we don't have peace just because we haven't asked the one who is peace. If you want to be settled, go to the one who is peace and allow the Holy Spirit of God to settle you in your spirit. Amen? Acts 5.19. Write that down as a reference. Because in Acts 5.19, the angel opens the prison doors. Isn't that cool? I mean, isn't that cool? Nobody thinks that's cool? I don't know about you, but if like an angel came to me like he did Peter, touched my rib cage and said, get up, boy. Put your shoes on your feet. Put pants on and a shirt and let's go. And then as we're going across the living room, he opens the door. I'm like, okay, wherever you go, man, I'm going. <laughs> Whatever you say do, I'm about to do. Wherever you say go, that's where I'm going to be at because this is real cool. Acts 5.19, this is what takes place. Listen to me closely. This is what takes place. The angel opens the prison doors, and he leads the arrested apostles outside. The angel then gives them the following directions. Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. L is capitalized. Stand in the temple. Speak to all the people all the words of this life. In other words, write this down. Go share the gospel message. Go share the gospel message. Write this down. The work of God will not be stopped. Ever. Everybody say ever. The word of God will never, ever be stopped. It will not be thwarted. It will not be changed. It will not be canceled. Israel's enemies have been trying to change the plan of God since almost the beginning of time. They're still doing it today, trying to plan, the, 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 trying to change the plan of God, and they still cannot be successful at it. They'll never change what God has set out to do. They will never, ever change what God has set out to do. Now, something takes place in Acts chapter 5, verse 21. Look at it. Acts chapter 5, verse 21. Watch this. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported. Let me stop right there for a moment. Something is going on here with the priest and the Sadducees. See, the priest and the Sadducees, they've got a legal authority. Matter of fact, go back to verse 24. Watch this. If we can get that on the screen, Acts chapter 5, verse 24. Watch this. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this uh, would come to. But we go in there to find them. We locked them up. We arrested them. They're not in there. Where are they? Where are they? And verse 25, someone came and told them, look, look. Look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and bought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So again, I say the high priest and the Sadducees, they've got legal authority. This is interesting. Pay close attention. They've got legal authority. They are considered to be dignified in their class. 
They are considered to be educated, and they were. They are considered to be authorized men to make decisions under the law, and they were. But here's the problem. They severely lack spiritual power. Today we have too many people in position that lack spiritual power. We even have Christians who have availability to that power, but they lack operating in that spiritual power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now let's talk about the apostles whom they arrested. The apostles were normal dudes. They were ordinary people, yet they were filled with the power of God. And so therefore, they had spiritual power in their ministry. I'm going to show you this in Scripture. So go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Just turn back just a little bit. You'll run into it. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And watch what is spoken of about these ordinary fellows. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were what, church? Uneducated, common men. Everybody look up here for a minute. I'm uneducated and I'm a common individual. And I confess that to you. The only reason I even graduated high school was simply because I was friends with my teachers. I confess that to you. And you can laugh, that's okay. It's not a joke, it's a true statement. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt my feelings. I was not smart in school. I did not care for education. Quite frankly, did not want to be educated. And I'm not boasting in that. That was the complete wrong attitude to have. But I can say this, when Jesus Christ got a hold of my life, I started paying attention to what the Spirit of God was doing in my life. That's what it's all about. So I stand before you today, never been to seminary, never been to a Bible school. I'm not smart enough to put together a sermon, but what I have realized is if I just listen to the Holy Spirit of God, he'll teach me how to put a sermon down, and that's been happening for almost three decades. If you're willing to listen to what God says, I promise God will tell you what to say. If you're willing to see what God wants you to see, he will open your eyes, he will open your ears, and he will prepare your heart. What we do not need is, a, and there's nothing wrong with education. Education is good as long as you let the Spirit of God lead you in it. And you have to nowadays because so much of education, look at what the education system is doing. Look at what collegiate education is leading people to. You better be led by the Spirit, brothers and sisters, when you get taught anything by anybody to know whether it's truth or not. So it says that they were just ordinary uneducated men. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Whoa. Ordinary, common men. However, because they submitted and surrendered to the authority of God, they were filled with the spiritual power in their ministry. It's a beautiful thing, really. Uneducated, common. But here's, here's the difference maker. Let me teach you. Here's the difference maker. It's said that they had recognized when the people saw them, and they saw their boldness, but they recognized them as being uneducated, ordinary, common individuals, it said that they recognized that those men had been with Jesus Christ. Write this down. Spending time with Jesus makes the difference. If you're in here today and you feel like you're not good enough, welcome to the club. You're not, and I'm not either. But when you spend time with Jesus, he's more than enough. When I am reminded by the enemy 
that I'm not who I should be. I remind him that I'm walking with Jesus and that's exactly where I need to be. When I spend time with Jesus, it takes away anxiety. When I spend time with Jesus, it takes away fear. When I spend time with Jesus, the truth exposes the lies of the devil. When I spend time walking with Jesus Christ through prayer and through reading scripture and through worship and through praise and through fellowship with other believers, through communion, recognizing what my Lord has done for me. When I spend time walking with Jesus, I'm reminded that I'm supposed to look just like him. All the time. The plan of God is unstoppable. And if we choose to walk in the plan, we are too. So here they see that they're common they see that they're uneducated. They see that they're ordinary. But they say this, we recognize that they've been with Jesus. Go to Acts chapter 5 verse 26. Look at it. We're going to go further in the text. Acts chapter 5 verse 26. Then the captain, so the guy says, look, they're out there. And they're out there teaching in the temple. The very reason you arrested them. They're out there still doing this. And verse 26, then the captain with the officers went and bought them, but not by force, for they're afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had bought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, it should be upon you. You're the one that killed him. And they're upset about it. They're upset that the truth is being told. Verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered. Okay, so here's the response from the, the apostles. We must obey God rather than men. Can we say amen to that? We must obey God rather than men. You know, I think that that is the biggest fear of Satan himself. Christians that will obey God rather than men. And I'm going to go a step further. Christians that will obey God rather than government. Christians that are not willing to keep their head in a hole buried in the sand, but rather than keep their head in a hole, they'll keep their head in the Word of God. So he says, verse 29, Peter and the apostles answer, we must obey God rather than men. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who do what, church? Who obey him. Let me just say this. People may think you're crazy right now. You got anybody in your life that thinks you're crazy because you're sitting in church right now? Do you have anybody in your life that thinks you're crazy because you've changed the way you talk, you've changed the way you act, you've changed your behaviors, you've, you've given up certain addictions? They just think you're th that blast from the past group. They just think you're a religious zealot, a crazy nut, and you're just in there with that cult group of people. You may, they may think you're crazy right now. Going to church, changing your ways, changing your speech, not cursing anymore, not having uh, uh, a coarse joking or a foul mouth, not showing up to the parties or the get-togethers that you used to go to. They may think you're the crazy one right now, but let me just say, write this down on all capital letters, but there's coming a day. But there's coming a day where even some Christians that said that, oh, Pastor Lee's a stick in the mud, that he won't let certain things go down in his church, he won't let certain songs be played in his church at weddings, he won't let us play certain songs at church and funeral, there's coming a day. They can think I'm crazy now, but I'm taking a stand for a reason, because I know there's coming a day where I will be rewarded for honoring my father. There's coming a day. There's coming a day. Oh, there's coming a day where I will be honored for the stand that I place upon the lives of my leadership. And I will, they may think I'm crazy. The people on the outside that hear about it may think I'm nuts, but I know I'm not serving those people. I'm serving a God who is righteous and holy 
And he expects me to be too. And he expects you to be as well. And he says, be holy, for I am holy. And do we fall short? Yes. Do we have sin in our lives? You better believe we do. But he expects us to repent the moment that we commit it, confess and receive forgiveness, turn away from the wicked way, and get moving closer to God than we've ever been before. So they may think you're crazy. Your spouse may not be as close to the Lord as you are. They may not know the Lord, and they may think you're crazy. Well, that's kind of good for you, but I ain't going up in that place. Oh, but there's coming a day. Listen to me close. There's coming a day, and I personally believe it's sooner than later. There's coming a day where there's not one non-believer, there's not one atheist, not one Muslim, not one whatever that is going to think that the church is crazy anymore. Write this down if you're taking notes. This is, this is what I really want to, 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 to mention on this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Let me tell you why you're not the crazy one. It says, so at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody, there's coming a day where even the atheists are going to have to agree and confess that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. That even the atheists will have to bow a knee before the Lord and confess that he's king of all kings, he's Lord of all lords. And everyone who thought you were crazy, they ain't going to think about that no more. Now they're going to understand you had it together the entire time. See, you may look like the crazy one, and I may look like the crazy one, but let me remind you of something. I've experienced this. Maybe you have. If you haven't, I guarantee you, you will. They're going to come to you when someone is sick and needs prayer. I promise. Hey, you're enough of a Christian that where you live your faith out in front of they may laugh at you, they may poke fun at you, but when someone gets sick, who you think they'll go call? They're going to come to you when life seems unbearable. They're going to come to you when a spouse... It's not honest with the other. They're going to come to you when tragedy hits in life. I promise they will. They're going to come to you when someone close dies. And in that moment, in that moment, you must realize the reason they're coming to you is not because you're crazy. Pay close attention. It's because deep down all along, they've seen the light of Christ shining from you. And watch this. Let me teach you something. Whether you know it or not, here's the truth. They have secretly, secretly, secretly appreciated and highly respected your stand for God. Secretly respected your stand for righteousness. Let me tell you how I know this. If they didn't, they wouldn't call you when the stick gets stuck in the mud. The reason they've called you is because all along they've seen something. They may poke fun of it because they don't understand it. But when it happens, listen to me, when it happens and they reach out, let me encourage you in the Lord, you must seize that moment. You have got to seize that moment. It's just like in the phone call when, they, when, when the blast from the past calls you back and say, that man's dead. But I tell you who has the number now. And when they, when they call and they say, please pray, so-and-so sick, please pray, so-and-so's in the hospital, please pray, so-and-so has passed, please pray, I'm having trouble in my marriage, please, please pray, the children are going crazy up in here. They say, you know what? I'm going to do better than just pray for you. I'm getting ready to pray with you. And you invite them Pay, pay close attention. You invite them into a conversation with you and God. You know what that does? It gives the Holy Spirit opportunity to work all over them. It gives an opportunity that they can hear that your prayer is genuine, your prayer is normal, your prayer is real. They say, wow, they did that? That's easy. I, I, I could talk to God like that. You must seize the moment. And let me just tell you this, the enemy doesn't want you praying. And he doesn't want you praying in public either. But God does. There's a sister in Christ here, <clears throat> while I was in Walmart, I ran into her too. I was like, man, I got to start going to Blackstone. Quite a bit of y'all live in Blackstone. And she's sharing with me some things she's going through at work and 
you know, sharing with me some a goal that she has. And at the end of the conversation, rather than just leaving, I said, you know what? Let's pray about that. Right here, let's pray about that. So we get blessed that we have an opportunity to pray together in public, but the public gets blessed because some people get to see hope. Some people get to experience that it's okay to pray in the wide open, and guess what? Nobody's going to come shut it down. God's plan is unstoppable. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. Watch this. It gets so good. Acts chapter 5, verse 33. Um, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him. Because remember what Peter and John and the apostles answered. They said, hey man, we can't, we can't listen to you. We got to listen to God. He then says, you, you guys are the one that hung Jesus on the tree and killed him. In verse 33, it says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But, after, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people. This teacher, he, he stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. Now what, what Gamaliel does, he stands up and the people, they respect him. The Sadducees and the religious leaders, the zealots, they respect him. And so he looks and he says, hey, have the apostles put outside the room for a minute. I got something to tell y'all. So they have the apostles taken out of the room, and this is what he says to them in verse 35. He says to them, men of Israel, take care, in other words, be careful, take care what you are about to do with these men, speaking of the apostles. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, speaking of the apostles, in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them what? Alone. He says, when it comes to these apostles, stay away from them, leave them alone. Here's his explanation. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. Verse 39, but if it is of God, you, read it with me, you will not be able to overthrow them. Everybody say, God's plan is unstoppable. Gamaliel, man, he sets the record straight, don't he? He says, man, I've seen people raise up on more than one occasion. They've pulled people away from you guys. They've pulled people out of the temple. They've done their thing. They've been attractive. They've been popular, but it never was accomplished. They died, the people dispersed, and everybody went on back to their homes. He says, but according to the apostles, if I were you, I'd leave them alone. Because if this is of man, I guarantee you the ways of man fail. Anybody know that? The ways of man fail. However, he says, but if, look at verse 39, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Now this gets really deep right here. Pay attention to this. Watch this. He says, you might even be found opposing God. That's dangerous. He says, if this work, if this work is of God, you can't stop it. He says, but if you try to stop it, you're going to find yourself opposing the plan of God. And then it says this at the end of verse 39, so they what? They took his advice. If you're walking in the plan of God for your life, the enemy will not be able to overthrow you. Now, he will still attack you, but he will not be able to overthrow you. And listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. The work you are doing for the glory of God in your life, I promise, we know it looking at Scripture, it will be unstoppable. I'm going to close with this thought in Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Just going to read you a few verses right here. 
And I'll tell you what, if you're able, go ahead and stand to your feet if you're able. You can still keep your Bibles out. This is what it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, and so basically Gamaliel, he stands up and he gives his advice. The, the Sadducees and, 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 and the high priests, the religious leaders, they take, they take him up on his advice. And verse 40 says, when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. Whoa. If you never read the text before, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? I mean, after all, the angel, the angel shows up, right? And the angel opens the door, right? And the angel gives them specific instructions. Go preach the message of the life. Preach it in its entirety. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, it is. And they're out there and, and they peacefully, they peacefully get bought back in before the council. It says they didn't drag them in there because, or be violent with them because the council was scared of being stoned by the people. Everything has been going good up until this point since the angel showed up, right? And then all of a sudden, when they're in there getting ready to charge them, Gamaliel steps up and says, oh, have those fellas put out of the room. Gamaliel speaks up and says, you might be opposing God. Y'all better be careful here. If this work is of God, you won't be able to stop it anyway. Don't waste your efforts. And you would think, wow, it's going really good for these guys right now. And then they bring them back in. And we're going to let you go. Yeah! But we're going to beat you first. Whoa. The fact that you're unstoppable does not mean that attacks will not come. If anything, it means this. We know through what Jesus says concerning our enemy, the attacks will come. The attacks will come. And it's amazing what takes place and how they respond. It says, verse 40, if you look at it, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then it says this, they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council. How? rejoicing see they went through a trial they went through a punishment but the plan of God is unstoppable they they couldn't hold them they let them go notice their attitude notice their behavior verse 41 then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name and every day everybody say every day and every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus they didn't stop they didn't stop I'm telling you the plan of God is unstoppable let's pray yeah, father I am honored and blessed and grateful and so thankful that the team that I serve always wins. I'm so thankful, Father, that you, through Jesus, your Son, have defeated Satan. You've disarmed my enemy. And I'm grateful that even though attacks arise, the family of God always wins <laughs> even if they bring harm to our body I've got a spiritual one waiting in glory and there's a glorified body coming one day father I'm grateful because even as this body gets older as it gets weaker as it begins to hurt we're thankful father that this earth is not the end game but we are working towards a prize we are working towards the glory that God is calling us into for eternity. Father, I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus that we have been encouraged today by your word, knowing, 
knowing that as long as we're walking with you because you're unstoppable we're unstoppable in the plan that you have for us your work will always go on and it is an honor to be able to be part of it as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ if you're in this place today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior let me tell you you too can be unstoppable you too can live in victory you too can have a life of righteousness and holiness because God will purify you through his son Jesus and he will strengthen you by way of his Holy Spirit so if you're here today and you say pastor I, I've heard what you said and I'm, I'm tired of doing it on my own I'm tired of feeling unaccomplished or maybe you do physically feel accomplished but spiritually you just feel like you're missing it all if you don't have Jesus as Lord and Savior you are missing everything and let me just tell you this he is more than enough and he's all you'll ever need so if you're ready to surrender your life unto the Lord and you're ready to ask Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your soul then I welcome you where you are right now to just raise your hand and I would love to say a prayer that you could say along with me and at that moment at that moment at that moment you are sealed at that moment your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life at that moment at that moment you are a child of God anybody in this room that says pastor I need that I want to trust in God I see you brother anybody else anybody else that says I need them I, I don't want to do it on my own I'm tired of struggling I'm tired of fighting I'm sick and tired of just being sick and tired I'm sick and tired of not having answers I'm tired of not knowing I'm tired of not having hope that is eternal and I am tired of putting in constant ways of the world to make me happy and it just keeps running out I've been there and the only true fulfillment you'll ever get is through Jesus Christ anybody else before I pray with this man that says pastor I need that too come on up here with me my man if you will let's congratulate this man on his decision repeat after me Lord Jesus I am a sinner and I ask you Lord to forgive me of my sins I recognize Jesus that you died on the cross so that I could be forgiven and I ask you now to come into my life save my soul and receive me as your child fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus name amen now I'm gonna pray with you father I thank you so much for my brother because at this moment he is now my brother in Christ Lord I pray that you would fill him and anoint him with the power of your Holy Spirit father that every empty and vile thing that he used to try to put into his life to to fulfill him would be seen as poison and filth and today is the day father where he experiences the wholeness Father, the fullness of what you have for him in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may he experience your righteousness and all that you've done on the cross for him, Father, becomes real today. We love you. And in the name and the blood of Jesus, I rebuke the enemy from trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Father, that you would keep the flaming darts at bay, that as your word says, he can look around and not see him in this moment, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Father, that when people who knew him five minutes ago call him, he could say, that guy don't live here no more. That guy just died. But I can tell you who this guy is. I'm walking with Jesus now. And he died on the cross for me. And he did the same for you. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody said, amen, amen, and amen. I love you, brother. God bless you, man. God bless you, bro. The Bible says, the Bible says that when one sinner comes to repentance, the angels in heaven rejoice. And so let's just rejoice along with the angels in heaven in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. See, 
what I love about preaching the word we just took one from the devil whether he realized it or not we just took one from the devil and the devil ain't happy about it so we need to pray for that man we need to pray for that man and Pastor Jim, what he said is right on. Pray for your leaders and pray for me. I appreciate it because the devil don't like that we're doing what we're doing and being obedient to the call of God. As you go, be blessed in the Lord. Receive from him today all that he has for you in the fullness of spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen, amen. God bless you, church.